So thank you everyone for joining us for Protect Your Electronics Power Outages. Um, Tim is going to give us the how to's and what to do and what not to do. So thanks, Tim. All right, thank you, Mary. So today we're gonna go over kind of some of the different ways to protect your electronics. Um, we'll also go over some of the larger options that are available in case you have money to burn. <clears throat> um, as always, if you are signed up for the email list, um, you will get a copy of the slides and you will also get the recording sent to you. The nice thing about the slides is that um, I do have some links in there that you're able to click on so you don't have to write things down frantically while we're going through this. The other benefit is the next time we do this class or the next time I update the slides, you can just go back and check the slides out and you'll have updated information for whenever we next uh, do the class. So, you know, in, in two years, you can still look at this and have fairly relevant information. The other thing I'd like to point out is I am not an electrician. So definitely, you know, consult a professional if you so desire. Uh, also always look at reviews for products. And if you're gonna be doing any of the larger things, um, I always recommend just getting a contractor or someone who specialize in it to install something like a generator. So to start off with, um, the first thing you can do to protect your electronics is a surge protector. Um, I do want to specifically state that uh, surge protectors are separate, are a different category than power strip. So a power strip, all that does is it will take the power from your wall and it will spread it out over multiple different inputs that you can plug things into. A surge protector will actually protect the devices that are plugged into it. Um, it does this by including a, short, a shorting mechanism and ground line, and it will also take any amount of electricity over a certain amount, and it will then shut off power to the surge protector. This is important because if you give a electronic device too much power, it can cause it to overload and then fail. Um, so at the bottom on the right hand side, I'm not sure if you can read that, but I have three little bullet points. Uh, one is clamping voltage, energy absorption rating, and response time. So whenever you're searching for a surge protector to buy, these are the three main things to think about, you know, apart from it having the correct number of outlets that you want or it having the long enough cable for you, you know, or if you want it to mount it to a wall, if it has the brackets for it, that kind of stuff. The clamping voltage or the UL rating, uh, you want lower numbers on that. So this is the amount of voltage that when is it's introduced to the unit, it will stop power. Uh, the energy absorption rating, higher is better, and that is the amount of energy that the device itself can handle and not transfer to your device, devices that are plugged in before shutting off. And then the last one is response time. Lower is better. These are all measured in nanoseconds, so it's a very, very, very tiny amount of time. Um, obviously, if the device can sense the surge sooner, that will be more likely to protect your electronic devices that are plugged in. Um, generally, uh, things like warranty um, or those limited liability, you know, $5,000 worth of protection, um, I don't generally use that as a gauge of how um, good a device is. Oftentimes, they will fight you tooth and nail on collecting any sort of monetary payout. So the you know, amount of money in the limited liability, to me, doesn't really matter. Uh, the warranty is nice. It just means that they stand behind their product. In case you're wondering, uh, this is kind of what different surge protectors will look like. 
If we look on the left-hand side, this is more of a traditional one where it has the two sides, it has one side that has the ability for you to plug in those power bricks and the right side where it will just plug in a lot more. Um, if we look at the top, this is kind of a fancy one. So the way I look at it is if you're looking for a surge protector that is going to protect small items in your house, things that are not very expensive, um, I would go with a more normal looking one, like on the left. If you have a you know $10,000 stereo system for your in-home movie theater in your basement or whatever, I would go with the more expensive version, which is at the top. The other thing I do want to go back on is, um, and I forgot to mention it, was uh, the power conditioning. Some surge protectors will have power conditioning. Um, if you have a device like a printer where the printer starts printing and then you feel or you see like the lights flickering or some other device that is plugged into the same surge protector like says it has low power you know the light gets a little bit dim or a computer will make like a clicking noise to tell you that the power is not great um, a power conditioner is very useful for that it kind of regulates the dirty power and it will make it into a clean power seeing as i'm not an electrician i don't fully understand what those words mean i just know that dirty power is bad and that power conditioners are more expensive so if you have any like issues like that where a device turns on and your other devices seem to have an issue with that um, buying a surge protector with a power conditioner can be useful the last one I have on this sheet or on this image is in the bottom right. And this is kind of a smaller unit that you plug directly into your wall outlet. The nice thing about this is it has a screw in the middle so you can plug it, you know, where the wall plate is, how it has like a little screw in the middle. That can just go right through this unit to kind of really adhere it to the wall. It's also kind of nice because you don't have a cable that's involved, so you're not going to be tripping on anything. Um, pricing, in case you're interested about that, uh, good, better, best. Generally, uh, you'll be spending about $25 on a good surge protector. Um, on the better surge protectors, so these are the ones with more outlets, more protection. You know, the number is either higher or lower, depending on if higher or lower is better you'll be looking at about 50 to $100. And then the high-end ones, you'll be looking at over $100. You don't, feel free to not spend tons of money. But again, if you have, you know, a home theater set up or you're protecting an electro, a piece of electronic that is worth a lot of money, it may be worth it to buy a better surge protector than trying to stick with $25 ones. At the end, if you so desire, uh, we can go through and click on the different links so you can see what the different ones are, um, but you can also do that in the comfort of your own home. Uh, for the most part, all of the links in this little presentation are to Amazon. Uh, oftentimes you can find these items in a store, uh, so like in Best Buy or Walmart or Costco or something like that, or you can find them online at a different retailer other than Amazon. But I find Amazon to be fairly ubiquitous, which is why I use it. Uh, UPS, this stands for Uninterruptible Power Supply. So this is generally what small businesses will use to protect their electronics. Uh, this provides more protection than a surge protector. Um, what this is, in a general term, is this is a giant battery that is between the power from the wall and your electronic device. The reason why this giant battery is very nice is because if your home experiences brownouts or short periods of a blackout um, where the power is like going on and off, on and off. With a surge protector, what will happen in your electronic devices is 
your house will lose power. Your device will then immediately lose power. Your power will then come back on. Your device will immediately turn on again. Then your house will lose power. Your device will immediately turn off. And it's that rapid losing and gaining of power that will kill devices very quickly. So what the battery backup does or the uninterruptible power supply does is it provides that power so that if you lose power or if you're in a brownout, your device will maintain power through that period of time. Um, so in terms of a computer, what will be nice is if you've ever worked on a desktop computer and lost power and your computer immediately shuts off, whatever you're working on, it's kind of a crapshoot whether you get it back or not uh, because your computer didn't have time to save anything. It just shuts off immediately. Um, so the power supply will provide you know, 20 minutes to an hour for something like a computer. Um, so that whenever the power is lost, it will still keep functioning and it, it will allow you to, you know, save it, save whatever you want. The other nice thing about this is if you plug in your modem and your wireless router into a UPS, if you lose power, that doesn't mean that you will then lose internet because the battery will keep those devices working. Um, also, if you're using, or you know someone who uses something like a CPAP machine, these will keep the CPAP machine running. So it's not incredibly um, jarring whenever those immediately lose power. Depending on the device that is connected to, the, to this, it will last from, again, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour for a computer, but other devices, it will make it last a lot longer or a lot shorter. You don't really want to plug a fridge or something like that into uh, UPS just because the, that load, um, generally a UPS isn't rated for that amount of load. Uh, the other fun thing about these is it will beep. Uh, Mary can attest to this, but um, if you're at all worried about losing power, but not realizing if your device has lost power, you don't have to worry. These beeps are so annoying and so loud, it's impossible to not realize what's going on. Very true, Tim. Very true. Uh, and here's kind of a quick look at what they at what you can expect to look like. One of the negatives about them is they are large, they are heavy, and they are fairly expensive for the better units. Um, so you do have to kind of have a dedicated place for it. This isn't something that you can, you know, stick behind a bookshelf or, you know, just lay on the ground and not have it be a toe stubbing hazard in the dark. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have an Amazon Basics one. This is a more of a cheap design of one. Uh, the cheaper ones are generally, they lay flat on the floor and you plug things into them. The more expensive units, like on the right, they're kind of more like little uh, tower computers, little desktop computers <laughs> where they stand vertically and you plug into the back. One thing I do want to point out is if you're able to see it in the middle picture, on the left-hand side, the outlets look slightly different than on the right-hand side. They have that white strip. So what UPSs will have is they will have, in general, one side, which is surge protection and battery backup, and the other side will just be surge protection. So what this is, so this is kind of nice. So what this means is, for example, if I look at you know a, a work office setup is on the left-hand side, surge and battery power, you can put things like your computer, a monitor, and your desk light on it. So that means if power goes out, those three things will stay on. And then on the right-hand side, you can put things like a printer. So if the power goes out, the printer turns off. The reason why you would want your printer to be 
just on you know on surge protection as opposed to battery backup is because your printer takes a lot of energy. This allows you to think about the items that you want to stay on in the event of a power outage and only keep those necessary items on in order to increase the amount of time you have before the device loses power. I will say um, some of these UPS units will have replaceable batteries, which will make it long term a little bit cheaper than if you buy a unit without a replaceable battery. <clears throat> but generally, you're just looking at capacity whenever you're talking about surge protectors. So for pricing for surge protectors, uh, we'll just go with the same categories as before. Good, better, best. Uh, good, you're looking to spend around $50 to $100. Uh, better, you're looking about $150 to $200. And then if you have, you know, an exquisite need or a very ex or very expensive things, um, then you can spend like, you know, $250 plus on a surge protector. Uh, generally, I find that good is perfectly acceptable unless you really are going for having a long amount of time with your devices working in the case of a power outage. The other thing is all the all the features that were in a surge protector are also included in a UPS. So in general, you don't have to really look at some of the numbers um, like you do with surge protectors whenever you're talking about UPSs because they have all that stuff built in. Um, does anyone have any questions or experiences with UPSs at this point? I know Mary's experienced the sound a lot, but. I have, I have, um, but thankful that we had it at the office. So any questions in the classroom? We don't have any questions. Doing a great job. I do, I do. Go ahead. All right, uh, Kathy. Here, Kathleen. This is Kath. Yeah, uh, Tim, you were saying on the first one, surge protectors better is 50 to 100. And then on the uh, power supply, it's good is 50 to 100. So you can spend 50 to 100 in either case and you'd be all set. Yeah, so I mean, it's, yeah, it's basically what you want, right? So with the better category of surge protectors, you're going to be getting, you know, a whole bunch of outlets. So on this one, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 outlets. Um, on the UPS, you're getting roughly the same amount, but maybe not as ideal a layout. So it's kind of a, what do you want? The other thing to note is if you look at the middle picture, um, you can't really plug in uh, bricks into it. You know, wherever you plug in something that overlaps onto another slot, it would then take away a slot on the UPS unit. So there, there's just more versatility when it comes to surge protectors. There's a question in chat. Okay, uh, surge protectors don't last forever. How often do you need to replace them? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, so in general, in general um, a good quality surge protector will let you know that it's time to replace it by it not working anymore. That sounds weird, I know. And it does mean that it broke, but it broke itself. So for the higher end surge protectors, um, they will kind of keep track of how they're doing. And then once it can no longer adequately provide protection, 
um, it will then just kind of, you know how they'll have uh, surge protectors, some of them will have that switch, that mm -hmm. on-off switch with the little red light, it'll turn off and you can't get it back on. Um, for how long will surge protectors last in general? I mean, it would not be uncommon to have them last over 10 years. These uh, generally don't, it, if, if the power is good um, and they're not being, you know, tripped a lot, 10 plus years is very easy for uh, surge protectors to last. Battery backups, you are looking at more like five years. Um, but that's also because the battery, if it's in use, uh, the battery will continuously be charging and decharging, uh, which will limit its life. And then after a while, the UPS uh, will start to scream at you uh, to replace the battery. So also while, you know, we'll just talk about the better unit, 150 to 200. Um, whenever we're looking at like a $150 UPS unit, uh, whenever it dies, that doesn't mean that you have to spend another $150. What that means is you will then have to spend $35 to buy a new battery for it. So Tim, we do have a question in the classroom. Okay. Yeah, um, on newer electronics, computers, TVs, and things like that, are is search protection being built into some of them? Is it a feature to look for when you buy a computer or a TV or something like that? Is 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 that a thing? Um, um there very well may be some level of surge protection built into electronics we buy these days. Um, I mean, there's always some sort of surge protection with like capacitors and stuff like that. Um, I generally go by the principle of liking to spread out um, my protection. So I like devices that do one thing and do them well, as opposed to relying on uh, built-in protections for a device. Plus, I just think of it as, you know, I, I have, for example, a TV, you know, I have a thousand dollar TV. Um, to me, it makes sense just to, you know, add in, you know, $25 for a surge protector, mm -hmm. just to protect that investment kind of thing. Yep. Okay, thank you. Question? Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I had a APC surge protector, probably gave it up 15 years ago, but it had an automatic backup of whatever I was, I mean, backup of what I was working on and then would shut down the computer. I don't know if that kind of thing is still available or not. Yep, so uh, certain UPS units uh, will have that functionality. So what you can do, um, I know APC, uh, which is owned by Schneider yes. Yes. and Eaton. Um, those are the two brands I generally like. Uh, CyberPower is also good. But uh, with APC and with Eaton, I know that they have a cable that you can plug in from the surge protector to your computer. And they include software with the th with not sorry not surge protector with the UPS, and they include software with the UPS that will basically allow you to say, hey, if I'm not you know at my computer after the after the UPS goes down to you know 50% battery, gracefully shut down my computer, um, which will allow it to gr do the graceful sh shutdown which will put it in the save state. So yeah, uh, that that's still a thing. And the higher end units will do that. I don't believe, for example, on the left-hand side, this Amazon Basics unit, I don't believe the Amazon Basics unit has that capability. So Virginia raised her hand. Virginia, do you have a question? Um, yes, yeah, just a quick question. I was just wondering if you would um, 
talk about what happens when your house is struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah. So oh, what happens what happens when your house is struck by lightning is uh, first of all all the breakers you know should do work right mm -hmm. they should save things um, but if that doesn't work or if it doesn't work fast enough then what happens is we go to the uh, energy absorption rating and the clamping voltage so if the system or if the device detects that excess energy is coming in, it will look at the energy and say, can I absorb this? So can I put this back into my ground wire and stop the electronic from dying, uh -huh. from the things that are plugged in dying? If it can't do that, then it looks at the clamping voltage, I believe I'm doing this order of operations, right? Mm -hmm. And it basically takes the clamping voltage and it says, okay, too much power has come on, I'm going to shut off. So if your house gets struck by lightning, the surge protectors and the UPSs um, will basically shut off that excess power before it gets to your unit, before it gets to the things that are plugged in. The benefit of the UPSs with that is it will shut off power to the wall, but it will then still provide the battery power to the devices that are plugged into it. Okay. Um, what if the uh, what if the lightning comes in on the coax cable onto a modem? <laughs> yep. So that's another very valid thing. Um, <laughs> if we look at the at the image that's on the screen right now at the very top, yeah. we can see that there are inputs and outputs for coax cable. Ah, neat. <laughs> so um, if that's something you are worried about or that you you know, I have, <laughs> then you would just make sure to get a unit that has the coax cables as an option. Um, so if you look at the surge protectors example, I have um, two of the units have those coax uh, options as well, the inputs and outputs. You'll oftentimes find newer models with ethernet cable inputs and outputs. Uh, because power can also be transferred over the Ethernet cable. And on older units um, or classically designed units, you'll also find the same thing for telephone cables. One thing to note uh, specifically for e Ethernet cables um, is that these devices are not there to really uh, save the speed of the Ethernet connection, so of your internet. Uh, so be prepared for a loss in internet speed if you use these devices for the, if you plug the Ethernet through it. Um, also, with coax, uh, this will induce a little bit of noise to the signal. Um, it's less of an issue nowadays with the HD, with all the HD stuff. Um, but back in the day, you could get a slightly fuzzier picture, as it were, uh, by doing a coax through these. Does somebody um, raise their hand? Do you want to ask a question? I raised my hand. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. I'm asking, it's related to the previous question about the lightning. And what are the general conditions that cause a power surge? <clears throat> um generally acts of god are what i would categorize it as um so you know if if like a transformer breaks or a, um you know even even like a squirrel chewing through a power line can do weird things and cause a power surge um so it's just a, a general thing i mean overall unless the wiring in your house has some issues with it um your house itself shouldn't really be causing any problems. It's normally from outside sources going into the house. Right. And my other question was, you're, you have a laptop computer, it has a battery in it. So if your AC power is cut off for any reason, the battery in your laptop will operate properly, right? You don't need a UPS in that situation. Correct. In that situation, it'd be totally fine with uh, you'd be totally fine with just a surge protector. 
the benefit of a surge of a UPS in that instance, though, is you'd get, you know, <laughs> much, you know, if you're if your laptop, let's say it can go eight hours on a charge with a UPS, um, which is essentially just a battery, you're gonna get, you know, almost a week out of it if you needed to charge it. So in in the uh, in the event of you know a blackout, you can still charge things like your phone or mm -hmm. your um, laptop or you know whatever other device you would you would like to charge during that time. All right, so we will move on to whole house conversations. Um, so if you are, you know, like me and occasionally laugh gleefully at the misfortune of others who are living in Texas. Um, but you also want to protect yourself from the same thing happening. Or if you're just, you know, living in New Hampshire, my house lost power a couple times in December. You know, it, it happens to us too. Um, you can get a whole house solution. And this is essentially um, the the basic way you can do that is with a portable generator. Um, and the nice thing about a portable generator is the price is low compared to the other options. So basically, uh, when would this be useful? This would be useful if you're gonna have a power outage for an extended amount of time. Um, I remember back in 08, because everyone in New Hampshire likes talking about the 08 ice storm, um, my parents' house lost power for almost a week. Um, granted, we were lucky enough that, you know, it's not like cold was the problem. So our fridge really didn't, we didn't lose food or that kind of thing. Um, but what a generator can do is it can provide power two things like your refrigerator or your just basic household equipment. Um, you know, it can even power an AC if for some reason you lose power in the summer. Um, these started about $1,000 for what would be able to run household equipment. Um, and the negative part about these is if you just buy the generator, you would then have to run extension cables two things in order to power them. The other negative is if you buy a gas generator, which are, you know, traditional gasoline um, are generally the cheaper ones. Uh, you have to remember that gasoline is not shelf stable for more than a couple of months. So sure. you'd have to remember to get new gasoline. You'd also have to remember to not just leave a full tank of gasoline in the generator for a year and expect it to work great. Um, it'll get really cruddy, kludgy, cruddy, whatever. It'll get like this weird consistency and stuff won't work. Um, but again, it's $1,000 if you experience a blackout for more than a couple of days twice a year. This is a fairly good um, option. Uh, if you want to make it a little better of an option, you can add a transfer switch uh, which uh, basically allows the generator to connect directly into your electrical panel. So essentially, your house loses power. You go outside because that, that's where gas generators should be, not indoors. You turn it on. You plug in that generator into the transfer switch. And all of a sudden, your house has power again. Um, if you're going to be mm. doing that, you would want to make sure that you get the right sized generator for your house. Um, so if you are in a house like mine, then with all the stuff I have, a thousand dollar generator would be fine for temporary usage. If you're in a larger house or you have multiple fridges or you, for some reason, want to run your washing machine, um, then you would want a higher end portable generator. Um, so total, the price would be around $2,000 if you wanted to add a transfer switch 
And I'm assuming if you're if you want to add a transfer switch that you wouldn't be doing it yourself. Um, if you do it yourself, obviously you can save a lot of money, but you also <laughs> run the risk of uh, death. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I generally recommend, you know, getting someone who's done a couple of transfer switches to uh, or working with the main electrical panel of houses to uh, to do that. <clears throat> um, the next option would be a permanent generator. Um, so it's a big, big price jump. We're going from about $1,000 to about $10,000. Uh, the reason why it's so expensive is because these are generally more for um, businesses or if you just want no downtime. Uh, what the generator will do is it will sense, all right, house has lost power, I'm gonna turn on. And then the generator will turn on automatically and your house will have power again. <clears throat> um, I don't really have any specific recommendations because this will vary greatly for your house size, since this is going to power everything in your house, whereas the portable generator, you can kind of choose what gets power and what doesn't. Um, but you also have to think about what fuel type it's gonna get. If you remember where I said gasoline that you get at the pump is not shelf stable for very long, um, these are not using that uh, that kind of fuel. Generally, what these will run on is diesel, natural gas, or propane. Um, so I have an example you you can click through for one for natural gas. I think it's probably about six thousand um, dollars. But basically, these generators are less. Uh, you need to do less things to them. They will automatically turn on and automatically turn off whenever power is restored. The nice thing with some of the natural gas ones is if you're already using natural gas to heat your home, uh, it can be fed from that you know, underground tank or above ground tank you have. So it's not something you have to separately fill. Um, it just kind of grabs it from what you already have. You just have to remember to, you know, keep it filled. <laughs> um, these whole house generators, they'll also have, if you, um, they'll also have like an out, outdoor thing, like a beige box um, that will just kind of need a concrete pad to sit on outside of your house. Um, so just be aware that it it doesn't look pretty, you know. <clears throat> and the last option is to go buy a car. <laughs> um, you can buy electric vehicles. Um, to be fair, you can also buy some uh, trucks will allow you to uh, use them as a generator and plug into your house. But uh, because this is Peterborough, uh, we are going to talk about electric vehicles because it's more green. Um, <laughs> recently, uh, and also during the winter months, if you search electric vehicle powers house, you'll get a lot of news articles about it. Um, the most recent one I saw was a Ford Lightning recently powered a home for two days while they were while the power is out for them, I believe, in Texas. Um, the Ford Lightning is $60,000. So obviously this is way more expensive than $10,000 for a rough price for a generator, but uh, you can drive this one. <laughs> so it does have benefits. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can do something like uh, if you want um, to use uh, sun, solar, there we go, solar panels. Um, if you, I mean, some of you may already have solar panels on your house, but you can use something like Tesla's power wall, which basically is a massive battery bank that will, um, take the power that is generated from your solar panels, put it in that battery bank. That battery bank will generally be used to, um, provide power for your electric vehicle. But in the case of a power outage, it can also be plugged into your main electrical panel, just like a generator, and provide power to your house. 
Um, but again, uh, these are you know fairly expensive options because you're buying a car as well. But just something to think about if you were on the fence about going towards an electric vehicle, you can just think of it as saving $10,000 worth of generator. Um, I do want to say that I did add the last section in mainly because my house uh, lost power and I found that mildly inconvenient. So I was thinking about generators, but in general, um, as high end as you need to go, uh, I would probably say UPS for your electronic devices and you're good. And for devices that you don't need on all the time, um, you really can't go wrong with a surge protector for the price. Yeah, um, so that is the end of my talking points. Um, but if anyone has any questions or wants me to click through any of the links, I'd be more than happy to. Um, Mary, do you have any uh, words of wisdom? <laughs> You're very kind. Um, no, but I do have a question. So you have the UPS, which has a battery option in it, which would would support something for 20 minutes to an hour. What about just buying batteries? I mean, you know, the, <laughs> that you just... I'm not talking about, you know, C or D or AAA, but just like a, a, so you lose power and you have these things so you can run it perhaps longer than 20 minutes to an hour. Would that make sense? Or is there something that I'm not realizing? Um, well, so whenever I put the 20 minutes to an hour on there, that's uh, basically the consumption of a, big desktop computer okay um these things will run your phone for way longer than is reasonable okay you know so um definitely power banks and stuff like that are good um but if you look into any of the kind of bigger power banks mm -hmm. that are used for you know tailgating or camping or stuff like that mm -hmm. um you ups units are generally less expensive than the portable things, mainly because they're not built to be portable. They're kind of just built to sit there with a heavy battery and you're not concerned about having carrying handles and mm -hmm. the ability to accidentally drop it, you know, from a two foot height. Um, so if, if you're looking at stuff that'll just, you know, keep your phone charged and stuff like that, um, these are overkill mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, mobile power, power things are very, very attractive. But if you look at the price per watt, um, these are competitive mm -hmm. with pretty much any other source of power, you know, electricity, power storage uh, you have. Thank you. And Doris had a question in chat. Yep. Is it advisable to still unplug devices during brownouts and power outages? So uh, if you have surge protectors, um, I always recommend to just flip the switch. Um, you know, so if, if you're in that event of a brownout where the power is cutting in and out, um, that's very bad on electronic devices. Um, so if that's happening, you can turn it off. Uh, just turn off the surge protector. Um, that's again, one of the reasons why a UPS unit's very nice because a UPS looks at a brownout and doesn't really care. It just looks at the brownout and it says, okay, I get, I'm getting charged half the time, you know, so mm -hmm. it's not going to lose power in a brownout. It's just going to keep grabbing power when it's available and it will just keep powering your devices. But yes, if if you don't have any sort of protection between your device and the wall, um, then I would definitely recommend unplugging um, during a brownout. Does anybody have any? Oh, Richard, go ahead. Richard, do you have a question for us? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I live in an all-electric condo, and uh, 
I would like, I don't know if Jim has any recommendations, something a little bit for battery, something that maybe people with RVs or something or people go camping, but something that would be able to maybe make a cup of coffee and uh, maybe a couple lights in the house. Not that I want to run the heating system or anything like that, but also keep my electronics uh, working during a, a power failure, let's say it lasts a, a day or maybe two. Any recommendations on something that costs a little bit more than the 250 bucks? I went on just quickly looking at the internet and I see they sell some of these things. They look like they're about eight, 900 bucks, but I don't know if he has any recommendations on to some of these which are better than others that I could have here to, to help out in a, in a power failure. Yeah, so my uh, general recommendation is go with a named company. Um, okay. Generac, uh, love them or hate them. They've been in business since I think 59. Um, and these are the kind of things that would be good in that situation. Uh, these are like their portable, portable ones. Um, you can find them from other companies, but basically you would just be looking for, if you wanted to like search around, you would do exactly what you just did and search for uh, generator, or sorry, um, you would search for like RV generator or RV portable power. Um, okay. I think... Uh, There was, yeah, so, I mean, this is biased, but um, EcoFlow is a good company, um, and these are basically UPS units that are made for traveling, you know, so they will be slightly more expensive. Uh, I've, I've actually played around with this one. Uh, but they do get fairly expensive. So this one's about 1,800 bucks. Um, and this one gives uh, 2,000. So in reference, um, one of the benefits that portable power stations will have is this 2,000 number. If we compare it to a UPS, So this has, uh, this is a 560 versus a 2000. So this has four times the energy storage capacity of this unit. But what isn't reflected in the price is this will power something that takes 2000 um, watts to start. So high, so with, I'm not explaining this really well, <clears throat> but UPSs are designed to provide a large amount of power for not large power devices. These portable generators will provide a large amount of power for large power needing devices. So like mm -hmm. the startup power that something takes um, is where these portable power stations shine and where UPSs aren't great. That's one of the reasons why you shouldn't plug like a printer into a UPS um, or you know a, a fridge whenever the condenser is running, uh, just because that, that power draw is very high and the UPS isn't designed for that whereas these portable generators are designed for that large power draw. Thank you. Yep. Anybody have any last questions? Does anybody on Zoom have some questions for Tim? Mary, this is I have a question for Tim. Uh, Tim, you mentioned the outlets go look for surge protectors. 
but would you do your typical ABC of the top quality surge protectors to look at buying? Yeah, so for surge protectors, um, we do have three, and uh, I do just want to say Generac does have a portable power station that is $1,000 and looks fairly good. But um, on to the next question. So surge protectors, um, these three units that I have in there, uh, we'll just look at the two lower end ones or the medium and the lower end one. Um, I personally like I do like I do like trip light. Um, both of these are trip light. Uh, I also like uh belkin triplate belkin and there's another company that is just eluding me oh anchor is also good anchor triplate belkin all good um you'll run into ones that are like uh, the house brand of places like uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, those are generally pretty good. Um, but the main thing to, so the main thing I look at is, is it a US based company? Um, and I don't mean that in, is it made in the US? I mean, just a US based company. Uh, those are generally the ones I trust more than, like, I don't know what this is. Yishu. You know, I'd, I'd go with the Belkin over a brand I've never seen before, basically. Thank you. That's a lot of really good information, Tim. Thank you very much. And hopefully we will have no more loss of power for the winter <laughs> but i will send yeah. this out to everyone um we'll load it up and i'll i'll send it out so if i have your email address you'll be getting it in the next day or two Thanks, cool Tim. thank you